What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome on into today's edition of PHLY Union Podcast. I have, of course, one half of your host here today, JP Zapata. Join as always with Renee Washington. It is the remote edition of PHLY Union Podcast. Of course, we are out of the comfort of our homes, but we are excited to talk some Union soccer. We had a Jim Curtin presser. We are getting closer and closer to the start of the Union soccer season. Renee, a lot to talk about, but how are you doing today on this snow day in air quotes? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I know. I'm glad that we've had a chance to, uh, you know, take today, especially this morning was really gross out. The roads were a mess. And uh, also it's given us a chance to kind of shift the look here a little bit and have uh, this remote show. I see, you know, people in the chat already talking Champions League. And yes. you know, okay, listen, it, it's a weird day. It's a Tuesday that like, I don't know. For me, it's weird because I thought we were headed towards spring. At least that's what Punxsutawney Phil told us. And yet here we are with a little sprinkle of snow. I'm hopefully the last of the snow because I'm ready for spring sports, warm weather, you know, shorts and all that good stuff. So uh, I'm pretty good. And I'm hoping this is like this is the end. No more. No mas. Por favor. Yeah, we are. We are ready to get to some warm season as we get to Union and Philly season closer and closer. You know, the closer we get to both of those seasons, Renee, it gets a little bit warmer. So the tans come out, sunnies come out. So I'm excited for sure. This one, this the snow definitely caught me a little bit by surprise. I'm not going to lie to you. And it always sucks because like, I don't know about you, Renee, but like when it snows, like I just get the inclination. I just want to like cuddle up with my dog in the couch, watch some movies, Netflix, and you know, all that good stuff. So, but I'm happy to talk to me in soccer here, Renee. No, I, I feel that. I feel that. I know Jillian, you're saying as a teacher, the snow day was very welcome. Um, I have teachers. <laughs> I have a lot of teachers in my family. They were saying the same thing. Uh, listen, the snow day is great for the kids, for the teachers. You get a lot of schools were closed. There were some with some delays, um, but a lot were closed. And like you said, JP, like I, I looked out my window this morning. And I was like, oh, I want to just be in my pajamas all day. I want to get the hot chocolate going. Yes. Fireplace on, get my movies, uh, my Hallmark movies, whatever movies I'm watching. Uh, yes, Hallmark is now a year round thing. And I feel that. But, you know, I feel like the conversation that we had earlier with Jim Curtin in his press conference helped me feel extra excited about our show today because it's like, listen, snow day or not, we've got plenty to talk about, a lot of great things going on, and we have only have one friendly left, which means we're that much closer to February 20th, which is less than, it's now a week away. So Valentine's Day is tomorrow. We've got the season opener next week. We've got a snow day. Like a lot is just happening right now, JP. <laughs> a lot is definitely happening. It's all happening quick. So that's why everyone's got to make sure they're following and subscribe to PHLY Union Podcast because we got we will get you keep you covered here throughout the entirety of the year, entirety of the season. So with that being said, Renee, let's let's get to some talking. Obviously, today we had a little bit of a press conference. Good to see Jim back out there. Uh, you were blessed enough to be part of it here today. So we'll kind of you know talk a little bit about the presser, some of the highlights here. Yeah. Jim was talking about. Yes, yes. And I do feel like I got a lot of union stuff today done too. Uh, you know, Dan, Will, Jillian, everybody that's in the chat, uh, hit that thumbs up button, join the conversation. There's a lot of positive things that came out of the press conference today with Jim Curtin. I was like, <laughs> the cat, <laughs> like taking all the notes. <laughs> I, like, I always have my keyboards down low so you can actually see it. So it looks like I'm like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but down low, my hands are like, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so lots of positives talking about the formation, which I, I know is something that we've discussed a lot on this show, especially when we take a look at the depth chart. And even as recently as our Thursday show, JP, that we were talking about, well, with the depth chart being the way it is, the union might be more uh, equipped for playing like a 4-3-3 formation or, you know, just having a three front. Maybe that's also a a three, four, three. There's a lot of different looks you can do with that. But in that Jim was talking about specifically uh, within the diamond midfield, being able to have the balance. You have Jack who's been doing a lot better job and Jack McGlynn being more offensive, great with the ball at his feet, looking to get forward. You have Jesus Bueno, Leon Flack when he gets back um, that are going to, Oh, that rhymes. That's more on the defensive side, more of the guys that balance your midfield. So the diamond midfield, um, as an area specifically that's got versatility, that's got balance, but also has the ability to change game the game, depending on the situation. I think it is useful in soccer to have a situational lineup and be able to 
you know, flex and fluctuate with what the game requires. Also with the amount of games they have being able to change up formations is useful. He was mentioning Ali in that mix as well as still being a key contributor that can play on that wide part of the midfield, but also can be a six, can be an outside back, can be kind of wherever needed, uh, where, you know, whatever the game calls for. But overall, as we know, the formation is going to be a week by week discussion, um, especially with a lot of guys missing throughout the course of the year at different times. But the key formation that is an area that I he, like he mentioned, the 4-2-3-1 as a formation that they can play, especially with Quinn Sullivan's versatility because he can play as a 10, a striker. He can play on the right side of a diamond. He can play anywhere in that front five or six, depending on what the formation looks like. Um, and having the luxury of being able to put him in those different roles is something we've talked about as a positive for Quinn but also a positive for this team. And a 4-2-3-1 is an interesting formation, JP. It's a 4-5-1, guys, in my opinion. Like, I look at it as a 4-5-1. You are sitting in with two sixes. You've got three midfielders in front of them, basically. You have one lone striker. If you play it well offensively, your three have to fly forward. Yeah. It has to shift to almost looking at times like a 4-2-4, four, four, mm-hmm. where you're getting all three of those players joining into the attack. Your outside backs are getting forward. But it requires a quick transition game. So I liked it defensively, but I'm not going to lie. Hearing it had me a little bit nervous offensively. Yeah, and like we know that before Ernst, this was Jim's preferred lineup. It was like what, like through 2016 through 2018, this was the the this was the formation. Every single match, Jim was essentially running through this. And the same conversation we're having now with the diamond, we were having those same conversations about the four two three one. But now the philosophy has changed with Ernst in here. But I'm not going to lie to you, Renee. When I saw that, I got me a little excited because you know that for me personally, I like tactile flexibility because I do think mm-hmm. that this team has different players that have different strong suits. And I think that especially a formation like a 4 2 3 one, we've talked about before, there are players that do fit better in a winger type of role. And this, this may be this may bode well for some of those players. But tactile flexibility is extremely important, especially when you know a lot of the problems last year was, yes, fatigue, but a lot of the the teams knew what was coming because they saw it on the tape and the union essentially were just saying like, Hey, you know, what's coming beat us. And so teams were starting to catch up to that. So I do like that. I do like the fact that they're going to be creative this year. And I think this is a gym and company have been somewhat tactically flexible the past couple seasons. Last year was a three, five, two the year prior. We saw the Christmas tree with the two attacking midfielders that would line up under Casper Shabilko. But I think with this one, in particular with the personnel you have throughout this team, especially in the attack, I did like hearing that. So we'll see how Jim and his tactile flexibility evolves here in 2024, Renee. So with this lineup then, who is your one? Is it Mikel Ua? So I would assume that it would be uh, – Oof, I, I would assume it would be Caranza only because I, Ua does have experience. I mean, Ua and Caranza both have experience as yeah. a winger. I just, for the finishing purposes of it all – I mean, I think everyone in this fan base would probably trust Caranza over Ua. I don't know if they would put Ua as a winger, though, just simply because just watching him play, he looks more comfortable as a center forward here. Yeah. But if you're talking simply off of finishing, you, you kind of do have to go with Caranza. He's more of your clinical finisher these days. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think for this formation specifically, having – Julian out wide allows you to be able to give him space as that one. You have to hold a lot of balls up. Your, your backs to goal a lot of times, you know, you're kind of linking the rest of the attack. So you have to be strong enough to do that. And it's a lot of pressure. Um, I think, Ua, and also just requires um, a different type of work rate. Like you're pressuring the back four, you're chasing, you're, you're starting the high press, which I know is something Jim was talking about with this forward group. You know, Gazda, Carranza, Ua, they are the ones, the team goes as they go. You know, mm-hmm. they set the tone. They are the ones that are leading the the pressure. But that one in a 4-2-3-1 is setting that pressure. Um, I know Ua did get his first goal of the preseason. Obviously, he had to, a later start to, to preseason than others because they'd wait for the green card and everything else to come into fruition and happen. And Ua got a goal. Ua, and that goal came off of being a, a player that's, Following up runs finishes a rebound. Of course, I didn't see it. That's just based off what I've heard from the the the, the live blog. But either way, um, <laughs> I, think Julian, I think Julian Carranza 
would do well as that wide player. And I think him and Ua would be flex, you know, interchangeable where they could switch depending on what's needed. They both could do well up top um, because I think Carranza would do well with space, though. I, like, if you had to choose, I feel like he's better with that space. Um, I know Dan in the chat is talking about running a 4-4-2 with Ua and Carranza up top, Gazag and Bueno in the mid, as the central middies. I agree with that, too. I just feel like with twin strikers, you need to have both of them that can – Occupy a lot of space, draw on the defenders, link their middies, make a lot of creative runs. And I don't know that Ua does enough of that, to be honest. So I feel like if I had to choose, I'd actually would rather have the 4 2 3 1 than the 4 4 2. And I love a diamond midfield. I used that used to be one of my favorite formations to play in. But I do feel like this team needs a formation that gives them space, creativity. And I would say that works well for Ua to be that target. So almost you're almost like a decoy. Um, holding up balls and then everybody else is able to link in and make runs off of you. So I see both sides of it, but this did have me excited because it does give you a lot of flexibility, especially with someone like Marcus uh, who can come right in and also be able to help be that winger. Um, he was talked about as well in, in the conversation with Jim that Marcus Anderson has been showing good progress, showing well in his minutes. He came yeah. in, in the second period of that scrimmage against SC Cincinnati um, about, you know, that 30 minute period that he came in and he's been doing a good job, getting more confident, getting better with, you know, his reps with the team. So he's someone that I think of Julian, even Daniel Gazdag, um, they would do well in that wide spot of yeah. hitting up and down the park. Yeah. Renee, l l let's, let's be honest here. I mean, this team didn't do anything crazy over the off seasons to kind of change the way it looks. So the fact is, is that fatigue may settle in again. You're going to play a lot of soccer matches here. So because of the fact that this team is essentially running it back again, there isn't much change. You can't just continue running that same formation. You can't continue running the same tactics out there. So if you're not going to have a different type of look as far as a lineup goes, I mean, the lineups are pretty much going to look the same every match from what it looks like on paper. You might as well throw a different formation that gets players in a better spot that looks different for other teams because the, 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 the tape's there. Everyone knows what's going to happen to 442 Diamond, and everyone everyone is going to see it coming. So I, I think that if it's we're not going to bring in different makers here in the as far as the transfer period, then I think a, a change in formation, a tactical flexibility is is what the answer is going to be in this long, strenuous season again in 2024. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. I agree with you. Something's got to change. Um, I know we talked uh, about that before the show. That was one of the biggest things that we had in terms of questions for the union this season of, okay, if you're running it back with the same group, what changes are being made tactically to be able to have more success this season? You know, last year, cool, made it to the playoffs. Uh, but last year overall, record-wise, production-wise, you still would like to see more. Obviously, you wanted a better run in the playoffs. And so I definitely think that when you take a look at this group, there's a lot of talent there. And changing the formation is a great way to spice things up a little bit and mix it up so that opponents don't know exactly how to defend the union. Yeah, absolutely. Did uh, Jim talk about Allie and his role this year a little bit? A little, yeah. So he did mention, um, you know, specifically Ali and Kai as guys that he's okay. happy to have back because absolutely. they add, first of all, you're saying that Ali will still be a big contributor. You know, obviously he is playing in that dual role as coach and player, uh, but he is going to still be a big contributor. He is going to still be able to, uh, he's comfortable out there. He's versatile, but for both Kai and Ali, there's the familiarity piece. And that's the biggest thing I took away from everything Jim was saying. That is really what this team is locking in on. No, they did not bring in these expensive players and make these, you know, big signings. They brought in, you know, names like Marcus Anderson, for example, um, Oliver Zemla, they brought in small, you know, pieces here and there. And so the whole point is, this is a group that has the talent. And Jim was talking a lot about, you know, to be successful in the MLS, you need to have talent, luck, chemistry, you know, all these factors have to play into it. And they're leaning on their familiarity with each other as the backbone of this team. They've got the chemistry. They didn't need to take time this preseason, for example, spending on building team chemistry and doing icebreakers and getting to know each other and Two it's truths important. and a lie. You know, they didn't need to do all that because they already know each other very well. If anything, it was more about balancing how much time they're spending together and making sure they're not getting sick of each other. Because preseason, for anybody, as we all know, that's been a part of a preseason at any level, it's a lot. You're doing 
two days. You're doing a lot of sessions today. It's a lot. It's like you're cramming so much into such a short time. You can get sick of each other. So he said it actually was the opposite, like trying to figure out a way to give them that balance. And Ali and Kai are a big part of that because they are two pieces along with like a Jacob Glessness and Jack Elliott and Andre Blake that have been such a big cog in the wheel that as a team, you know, you already know the core values, the core chemistry is there. And now it's about just consistently producing. So those two specifically were brought up as important pieces because of that. You know, now you mix and he was saying the younger guys, the Academy players, Union 2 players that are not yet ready, but they're at least adding a little bit more energy and life into training um, that you can start to see the next generation learning from the veterans in that sense. But just trying to keep things fresh and trying to make sure they're finding that balance as a team on and off the pitch. And those two are a big part of that. So it seems like they're very optimistic on the backbone of the Philadelphia Union for 2024, relying on chemistry. Next player up, selflessness, team first mentality versus just this flashy, flashy team that spent a lot of money. Chemistry, Kenny, chemistry. You <laughs> feel me? But listen, you know, obviously chemistry is important for our soccer team, but you know also is important for your daily life, ladies and gentlemen. That is making sure that we are eating clean in 2024 because obviously it can be very difficult with the busy schedule. Obviously, Renee and I know very well with our busy schedules, it could be tough to get a healthy meal in. So with our sponsor here today and Factor Meal Kits, they make it easy for you to eat healthy. And obviously with the crunch of time, they make it fast for you as well. Factor Meal Kits have a bunch of different type of options for all your meals from ketos, calorie smart, vegan, veggie, and much more. So different dietary restrictions and just diets they like to accommodate here. So two-minute meals fuel fast with Factor's restaurant quality meals that are ready to heat whenever you are. And these meals, ladies and gentlemen, they come from certified chefs here as well. They are creating these here for you. So definitely make sure you guys are checking out factory uh, meal kits here for all of your good eats healthy and on the go make sure you guys check them out and right now with our promo code union uh, 50 you you can as well ooh, you can as well <laughs> just notice that one. you can as well oh, <laughs> you can as well enjoy uh 50 off of fact factory meal kits here off of your first purchase here with factory meal kits so that again the code is union 50 head on over to factory meal kits and then use the promo code for 50% off of your first purchase there of Factory Meal Kits. Thank you to our sponsor here today of Factory Factor Meal Kits. So, Renee, as we continue here with, uh, with the press conference here, uh, Jim also, I've noticed he's been bringing up a lot of Marcus Anderson, which is very interesting as well um, because – this was a, a signing that, let's face it, a lot of the fan base did, did slander. Well, not a lot, but a good portion of it slandered the, the signing because it probably wasn't a Cristiano Ronaldo or Leo Messi they probably were wanting or expecting. But it seems like he may have used it as a little bit of a chip on his shoulder, and he's impressing in training. Yeah, well, you know, JP, before I tell you about the impress, 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 wow, words, impressive performance by Marcus Anderson. Dang it, I butchered up my transition. Let me try that again. Well, JP, before we talk about the impressive performance by Marcus Anderson, let me tell you about the impressive work that Mortgage CS is doing. So Mortgage CS, which stands for Mortgage Concierge Service, they're a white glove service based right here in Philadelphia. They really focus on giving the full control of the lenders they work with, being available 24-7, being able to connect with their uh, clients in such a positive way. They're working coast to coast, and they're also making sure that they're helping everyone from California, Colorado, D.C., Delaware, Florida, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Virginia, all over the map that they're working with to be able to provide great service. So with the spring purchase markets almost here and heating up quickly, because although it may have snowed today, we are getting closer to the spring and the market for buying a house is heating up. Many clients, especially those first time home buyers, are reaching out with questions, asking about rates, asking about the ups and downs of the market asking about what everyone's doing. And with Mortgage CS, they do a good job of answering those questions. You can get in touch with them. They can help prepare and ensure that you'll be able to stand out and make the strongest offers possible. So at Mortgage CS, they want to educate and empower their clients. They want to make sure they help their clients get ultra competitive rates. And they do a good job comparing rates between multiple lenders to find a deal that makes the most sense for you and for your family. So with that exceptional customer service and 24 seven availability, head on over, reach out today. You can connect with Alec and Ben. Ben is their CEO. They want you to reach out morning, evening, night, 
rain or shine, snow, call, text, whatever it may be, uh, Ben's number right on your screen. And for those on podcast platforms, 267-391-7425. Shoot them an email at ben at mortgagecs.com. Or you can reach out at mortgagecs.com slash P-H-L-Y to get started. And this advertisement is not a commitment to lend or extend credit. Mortgage CS is an equal housing opportunity mortgage broker. All loans are subject to credit approval. Certain restrictions may apply. Company NMLS ID number 1464766 and visit mortgagecs.com for more information. All right, to the task at hand, as we're discussing a lot of excitement. Yes, the kid is dropping, Dan. I know we're talking about the formation. What's up, Rainiel? Uh, Listen, as we've been talking about the union in a lot more detail, part of the excitement is not just on running it back. It's also the fact that there is some new blood that is spicing things up and adding some flavor. And we talked about this actually with Marcus Anderson, with Oliver Zemla, with adding these young players, they also just add a freshness. And Jim touched on that a little bit today in the press conference. They add a freshness in training camp. They're excited to be there. They're excited to work hard and show what they can do. And Marcus Anderson has been a bright spot because he's coming and done well. He's um, got some. He's got a, a great skill set, a different skill set than many. He's not um, someone that's going to come in with the expectation of just sitting the bench. The hope is he can be a starter. Jim was mentioning they want him to work to push to be a starter and push you know, that, that top group, he's not just brought in to be a number on the roster. And he's, as I mentioned before, getting more used to the team, which as you're getting comfortable and confident, that's the best way you, you play as a player and be able to show your skill set. So for Marcus, he's got the speed, he's got the size, he's got the physicality. He could be someone in a 4 2 3 one that can hold balls up and be that one or be out wide running at defenders, taking them on 1v1, getting flank services. Look, we saw the goals that the union scored in their last friendly, the loss, well, we didn't see it. We heard it. Uh, the goals that were scored came off of services, came off of shots from distance. You know, that's a lot of the strength of this team. And Marcus Anderson's skill set as a speedy, aggressive forward that likes to get forward, that likes to get services, that likes to take defenders on, from what we've heard, should be able to help add to that. So I'm excited because for Wednesday's friendly, we can actually watch it. And I'm looking forward to seeing in person, in virtual person, um, what type of skills players like Marcus and Oliver have, because there is the expectation that there are some guys that already are close to 100%. You know, preseason is about getting game ready, getting fit as much as you can possibly be in February for yeah. the season. You're not, you're not peak fitness because you don't want to hit peak until, you know, October ish, but you are ready to play a 90 minutes. So Jim was mentioning, there are some guys that are closer to that 90 minute spot. Um, And so tomorrow they will not play 90 minutes. They might get 45, 60 minutes. And then there are others that will get more time. And this is still a chance to see some players like Marcus Anderson, see what they can do in their minutes. So I'm looking forward to being able to watch that virtually and see what the team is looking like on the pitch. We get to watch an actual preseason match. What is this? I'm I'm excited to watch this as well. Uh, EAFC 24 does not rate Anderson as much as Union do. 49 rating, 58 potential, 64 sprint speed. Dan, that's why they put these ratings out. This is why this is great content for the NFL, the NBA, those ratings right before the season starts. Oh, yeah. That drives a player. So I want to get Mark. Yeah, let's get Marcus Anderson to at least a 60 this year. What do, what do we say, guys? But uh, I'm, I'm excited about Marcus Anderson. When Jim hypes someone up, I, I tend to believe it because when I didn't believe him, that was back with Brandon Aronson was, was coming. I was like, what are you talking about? His young, like 18 year old. He's taking over Derek Jones. There's no way he's taking his job. And he did. And he did. So he was right. So we're, we're talking about tactical flexibility. We're talking about potentially using some wingers and Mark Sanderson seems to be strong at that. So I'm excited. I'm, I'm looking for, I'm looking for a lot tomorrow. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of names out here that I just want to see, see from in general. Marcus Sanderson being one of them, Jaime Bredicio being another one of those mm-hmm. I'm very excited to see as well. But um, it, 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 if you work your ass off here in training, you show Jim what you got. You will get some minutes here in the game. What's up, Travis? Yeah. How we doing? And I, oh, yeah. What's up, Trav, man? And I think to your point, Dan, about the ratings, this is exactly what this team is. When have we ever seen a Philadelphia Union player highly rated, high expectation? This team is built off of underdogs, those under-the-radar types of players. This is no surprise to me that Marcus Anderson is someone that when 
The signing happened. As you talked about, JP, everyone's up in arms and like, oh, what? why did the union bring in Marcus? Who is this? What's he going to do? How's he going to help the team? We're, we're a win-now team. This is not a win-now move. All these things that we heard. Um, but it's it's time for them to bring in some young players. And, you know, Jacob Glesnes is getting back to being fully 100%. Obviously, the hernia surgery back in 2023, all the way last year, uh, he's recovered from that. He's getting sharper and better every day. Um, he's a guy that's that there's no worries about. It's The questions are around those youngsters. What can they do? How can they help? I argue with you, Jill. And if you have a chance to bring in these young, underrated players that people do not really have a lot of you know, film on and notes on and information on that slip under the radar and you can get them for the price point that the union have, which we know they do not like to spend money. It's a win-win. There's a, there's a high upside to that. So I'm, I'm drinking a little bit of the Kool-Aid. I'm believing a little bit more because as you mentioned, JP, with Jim mentioning these things, you have to believe there's some level with his optimism of truth behind it. Like he didn't, he could have easily said, you know, Marcus is a young guy. He, he might get some, he's probably going to get a lot of union two minutes and, you know, we'll, we'll continue to evaluate him. No, no. He said he didn't, he did not come in to be a bench player. They brought him in to push, to be a starter, to be a piece that can help. So if, if that was the scouting report and expectation for why the union wanted to bring in Marcus, I have nothing but high hopes for him. And Oliver Zemla is another one. He was brought in to be able to play 90 minutes when Andre Blake cannot. So for these these under the radar players that have you know maybe some youth raw talent, um, just that fire to want to help compete and and just excitement to be out there, positives, lots of positives. Positelphia, where's Father Ben? I like that, Jillian. Um, so here's kind of where I'm at with this team going into this year. So look, I, I love the Union Way. I I think it's a big reason why we've been so successful the past couple of years. But we are kind of getting into a, an interesting kind of place here in 24, Renee, because we're running it back. We're running it back again. Um, it's the same philosophies as far as tactic goes, just the way the team just operates on a day-to-day -day basis. The emphasis in the youth academy developing from within, it's fine and good. But when you were on the doorstep of winning an MLS Cup and – I would expect that everyone, not only just the fan base, but that the, the front office all have the same thing in mind, winning a championship. I just don't see how you can look at the past two years. I'm just looking at these past two years and do the same exact thing and expect a different result here. I want to look at the positelphia in this, but I'm just trying to be realistic with it as well. We'll talk about the Eastern Conference a little bit, Renee. But you look around this Eastern Conference, it's much better. It's better than the West. And for the union, you can't just rely on high pressing, on, on just being a tenacious soccer team. No, what's going to happen when, you know, Messi and co are at 100 percent? That team can score with some of the best in the world. So this is kind of where my dilemma is, like, is running it back going to bode well for us here in 24? That's where I'm struggling with. I know. And I know. And I know today, guys, we are going to get into uh, our our predictions for standings for this upcoming season for the M across MLS, listen, I want to believe, and I'm having the same issue with the Phillies, which is why I feel like I'm just repeating myself. I'd like to believe that just running it back with the same group, they'll have chemistry, they'll just be better. Like, I struggle with just this expectation, everyone's just going to be better than last year, because every team is thinking that same thing. Like, that's the goal for every single team across the league, and every single team across any competitions the union are going into are coming in with the expectation their players are going to be better. No one's coming into it like, oh, they're going to be worse. They're not going to work out this offseason. We're not going to we're not going to do any training. They're going to be worse. No, the, everyone's maturing. Everyone's getting better. All the chemistry is getting better. So, you know, that whole like hopeful just like everything will be fine. Everything will be better. It's giving the burning house gift <laughs> of like it's fine. It's fine. fine. It's fine. Like, mm, is it though? Because we are seeing so many changes happening around soccer, not even just the MLS, soccer, where teams are retooling and the union are just running it right back. So as we were going through, and I think this is a great segue into our standings that we'll get into in a moment, as I was looking at predictions for who I think is going to finish as a top team in each conference or bottom team for each conference, I was like, you know what? The union realistically could finish in the top three, the bottom three, or anywhere in between in the East. Like the 
that's what makes it worse. Forget just the league. The Eastern Conference is stacked. I know Jim talked a little bit about that today of the gauntlet of the East. Uh, that's an understatement. It's it's really, really competitive. It's extremely difficult to pick a top team. It's extremely difficult to be able to just say this team's going to be the best. So I'm a little nervous, to be honest. Yeah, it is definitely going to be tough. So Dan in the comments says, I don't think there's a scenario in which the Union are average this season. Either we win the whole damn thing or it all <laughs> blows up Eagles. I'll be I, I mean, Dan, honestly, like the Eagles in the Union season last year, this past year, felt very, very similar. I'm not going to lie to you. Just like that fatiguing feeling that you felt at the end of the Union season, I felt the same way about the Eagles season. I think that the Union this year, I don't think I don't see a way where they like bow out they don't make the playoffs i don't see them contending for the wooden spoon but i can see the union finishing like sixth seventh maybe eighth place fighting for one of those final playoff spots and maybe getting bounced in the second round here again i think that's like the worst case scenario best case scenarios are back in the mls cup i think that's kind of where they're at but also too dan what you don't want to run into and this is kind of like the NBA equivalent of the Sixers in like the late 2000s, early 2010s, is you don't want to run into no man's land where you're just like making the playoffs, you're bowing out in the second round, and you're just going through this constant, constant just flow of just making it to the second round and getting bounced out. So that's why that's why this, this season is extremely important, and I hope that the union are on the same page because either we make the proper proper steps here this year or there needs to be some serious changes. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, listen, there's a lot of concern and questions around Philly sports in general. I know James Alexander is saying, let's find a way to keep, <laughs> let's a way to keep us on Reddit. Yeah, we I agree. <laughs> football talk into football talk. Um, could not agree more, but that is what's concerning to me, that there's a lot of similarities that I see in the Phillies and the Union that we heard from the Eagles and the Sixers even. And now Sixers is a different issue. Injuries were a big part of that, uh, but the Eagles ran it back with the same group, guys, and it was a huge regression this past season, especially when you look at the last six games, last seven games, including the playoff game. So overall, I'm just nervous because other teams are finding those areas of weakness, improving them, getting better, adding better players versus just expecting the other guys to be better. So I would like to think that, you know, the consistency of having the same group year after year helps, but that's not the sports world we're in anymore. From yeah. college sports to professional sports, season to season, it's a different group. It's a different team. That's why the transfer portal is going crazy in college mm -hmm. sports because there's a lot of players that are like, you know what? Gone are the days of like, I'm going to stick it out with the same group and we're just going to get better season after season and chip away. No, no, I'm going to make a move. And we're going to just be better instantly. So I do think there's going to be a learning curve and transition period for other teams, LAFC, Inter-Miami, SC Cincinnati. I think there will be a transition period where they'll have their hiccups as bringing in so many new pieces. But I don't think it's going to be that long of a transition period. And so it does make me nervous. But I am positive with the starting 11 and the quality that the union had, Dan. I agree with you there. But overall, when I look at the standings, of who could possibly finish in the top and the bottom of this group, I don't know where the union fit. It could be all good or all bad. I agree with that. <laughs> that is, you really bring up such an important point that no one ever talks about. You do run into somewhat of a risk when you do run it back because I feel like a lot of the times is there's like a little bit of complacency. Like I'm sure the Eagles after the Super Bowl looked at each other was like, oh, we'll be be right back here next year. We we got this. We got. This. I remember. Randy Moss, after his second Super Bowl, I'm sorry, after, no, after the first Super Bowl when they lost the undefeated season, he's talked about how the 98 season, when they won the championship, he thought they would be back every single year. And it took them all the way till 2000 just to get to the freaking Super Bowl. And obviously they yeah. lost there. But you run into that risk every single time you run it back because you've run into that complacency factor. That's why the Warriors every single year take a deep dive and take make do some oh, tough yeah. decisions on their roster. That's why they've been consistently so good. The Chiefs as well. They've been so good because they made some seriously tough decisions over the past couple of years. You want to be good. Listen, you're going to probably make some enemies, but if you want to win, you got to make those tough decisions. And so, I uh, will we'll see if this we'll see if this does pay off here for the union. It'll 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 definitely be interesting here. Any any last bit tidbits before we move on from the from the press you want to bring up, Renee? Um, no, I mean I listen. I think the biggest things were hit on. Um, you know, everyone's just getting up to speed and getting fit and finding their way. 
But I agree, it is a little nerve wracking because um, in this day and age, you do see teams when they when you get stagnant and you're not making moves, you're getting passed, and it's hard to get back to the forget the championship of your respective league. It's hard to get back to the playoffs. It's not easy. It's no guarantee. I will just be back. You can never take that for granted. But uh, that's why we also can't take for granted things as simple as jersey prices because, yeah, I've been seeing the buzz going on around jersey prices, and it's insane how expensive they are. I know it was in the chat earlier. Um, Spending about $100 for a replica, not being able to buy authentic jerseys for a good price. Yesterday's price is not today's price, guys, but that's why we have some great deals where you can take advantage of to try to save. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So with that being said here, ladies and gentlemen, let's get a word here from our sponsors here. We're going to talk about game time app, ladies and gentlemen. Stressful buying for events, sporting events, concerts, no such thing. So I'm running into a little bit of a pickle here, Renee, oh because boy. these next couple months, this Colombian here has a lot of things to attend, whether it be sporting or concerts. Here in Philadelphia, we have Bad Bunny in April. We had Fade yes. coming here in June. I have the Colombian national team versus the U.S. men's national team a little friendly here in June. So what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to rely on the game time app, and you guys should hear as well. Right right now, if you download the free app, you can already check it out. They make buying events, tickets for events so easy. You can even see the seat that you're going to sit in before buying. Even better, you will see the exact price you're going to pay before even checking out. Gone are the days of seeing a $50 ticket and going to checkout and it being $200. Uh, uh, uh. With game time, no such thing. And we got you covered always here at PHLY Sports with the promo code for your first purchase over at game time. PHLY, you'll get $20 off your first purchase of your event there. So make sure you guys download the free app. Check them out. Thank you to our sponsor here today of the game time app. Yes, and while we're talking about some sponsors, let's talk about Bagels & Co. Brooklyn-style bagels made in Philly with Philly love, giving you that mom-and-pop shop feel. And with Bagels & Co., they do a good job. They've got huge bagels, the biggest bagels in Philly. Uh, They have a range of 15 to 20 different fresh bagels you can choose from daily. They have seasonal bagels, so with Valentine's Day tomorrow, with St. Patrick's Day next month, you can get some Valentine's Day themed or St. Patrick's Day themed bagels. They also have a large cream cheese variety, about 30 different flavors of different cream cheese and schmears that you can take advantage of. And just like their bagels, their cream cheeses are also seasonal. So they do some Philly sports specific ones. Of course, with us having all the success of our Philly sports teams, they'll do a Sixers cream cheese or a Flyers cream cheese. Or now the season's finally getting started soon a union or a Phillies cream cheese. So doing a great job of just providing you guys with a lot of options, but also at a great price. And with affordable prices, especially in today's inflationary world, with as you're talking about Jersey sales going up, everything is going up in terms of price points. But at Bagels & Co., you can get some delicious options for a good price. They give you the everyday brand. They give you high end without having to spend high end, without having to splurge and break the bank. So you don't have to worry about spending lots of money like you do at other places. And you can get the best Brooklyn-style bagels made right here in Philly and head on over to thebagelsandco.com to find a location at the Bagels & Co. nearest you. Well, uh, JP, honestly, just about your bad buddy point, I'm pretty sure there's an after party happening in Philly in April. Um, I'm not a big club person anymore. I don't think you are either, but I feel like Bad Bunny is supposed to be there. Apparently, you probably should make your way down to. I'm not promoting for them, and I'm not going to say the name of the place, but there is a place that apparently there's an after party for his tour. So just saying, just saying. I I will I will definitely be. I just I would love to just party one time. But I'm not. Listen, like you said, not much of a party these days. Sometimes I do like to get it out of the way because it's good for the soul. Yeah, you need but, every once in a while to party and turn up. Party with Bad Bunny. I'm in. <laughs> and the, the tickets actually i was literally ironically just got an email today about it like hey there's bad bunnies coming to philly and we're having an after party and I'm like oh i might be there i might be it's there be cool. it is gonna be a good one it should be a lot of fun here <laughs> but yeah it's ba- uh real quick I, I do i do just want to put in um just a just a comment on these Uh-oh. these jersey prices here like i i just want to know why because like I feel like NFL, like we're getting an NFL jersey prices these days. Like we're obviously trying to grow the MLS brand as a whole, but why are we pricing our jerseys to NFL prices here? 
like are we trying to gain fans or like what are we doing here <laughs> I don't know why prices are going up for literally every jersey. That's there true. used to be a time you could find some good, authentic jerseys for a good price. But now you go like site to site to site and they're all the same because they're trying to keep up with the other ones, which I feel like is actually hurting your business. If you charge a little less than your competitors, you probably would get more people buying, which is more of a quantity of people buying. But I don't know. It just to me is like, I think with soccer specifically, the soccer world is on notice and people are trying to capitalize on that. The fact that there are more people paying attention to the MLS and the NWSL specifically yeah. now more than ever. International soccer is huge. Obviously, the World Cup's coming up. Olympics will be here before we know it. They are trying to capitalize on it, but it's a disservice to the sport. It's not fair. Yeah, uh, Trap Man's right. DH Gate looking real <laughs> nice these days. <laughs> I don't blame you, man. And oh, Trav, man, uh, t I just actually checked today. They're pretty pricey. Uh, that around makes like sense to me, though. Two hundred some. That's why I use the game time app, guys. So I'm just, just saying, just saying. But yeah, they are, they are pretty pricey these days. Looking like Eagle tickets. Oh, um, man. but uh, Renee, should we move on to our predictions here? A little yes, yes, little, yes. Little season predictions here. All right. So, so we're what we're gonna do, guys, is um, we don't have a whole show to go through the whole Eastern and Western Conference, but we're gonna get to the nitty gritty of it, the, the the meats and potatoes of this. So we're gonna look at Eastern Western Conference. Renee and I are gonna give you our bottom three teams and our top three teams. So let's start off. Let's start off with the West here, Renee. Let's start yeah. off with 14th place in the Western Conference here this year. Who you got? Okay, wait. I'm scrolling. So. <laughs> It's I was tough. Like, <laughs> I'm over here calmly trying to scroll through to the bottom. Now, okay, this is really hard to do because the – like, I feel rude to say, oh, you're probably going to be the worst team in the league this year. Sorry, not sorry. Um, but somebody's got to be at the bottom of the standing. Yeah. So, for me, it's oh, – I wish I could just – you know what? Let me just pull up where I actually had them written down beautifully instead of this method that's not working. All right, so my worst team – out of the West is Sporting Kansas City. Okay. Yeah, SKC. Yes. Um, listen, I just feel like the – so my reason, my rationale for most teams that are at the bottom of the standings is that you just didn't do enough, which is why I find like – I feel like I could put the union in that same conversation. Uh, you just didn't do enough this offseason transaction-wise to really be able to compete with the rest. Sporting Kansas City I feel like is in kind of a wait-and-see type of a mode. They're rebuilding. They have a lot of pieces – uh, injuries like Kyrie Shelton, um, but they just have a lot of pieces they're just kind of waiting on. And I feel like while you wait and see, just you know, you're going to be down there doing it. Who's your Who's your last place team? You're You're spot on. Like the, these these three teams in the bottom of the of the West, I just don't think they did enough. Now we do have some time here. We still do have until April for some of these teams to make some moves within the league. Exactly. But I got San Jose here finishing oh. last. Again, not doing enough. They lost their best player in Cade Cal, who's killing it with Chivas, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I just think that with the West being so tough, I, I think that that's a team that may finish. I, I think that these three teams that we're going to talk that, I, that I'm going to mention here, I think they could finish very similarly to uh, to each other here. Wow, Trav, man, wait, 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 Tra All right, All right. You, you go, Renee. <laughs> All right, my actually, I'm glad because you, Trav, man, and myself at least have this team in the bottom of each of our conferences. I'm interested to hear what other people have as well so i also have san jose uh right above sporting kansas city i think amal pellegrino is going to be a nice addition uh but i do think like you mentioned with Cade cowell out um and just in general they've made some other moves like uh vitter costa bruno wilson that they've added but i still don't think they've done enough offensively to be able to score and keep up and at the end of the day if you're not scoring goals it's going to be a lot on them all. Uh, if you're not scoring enough goals, you can have a great defense. You can uh, retool your back line like they seem like they're doing, but it's not going to be enough to win games. So I actually have San Jose sitting right in front of Sporting Kansas City. Okay. All right. So I have a 13th uh, Minnesota United. Oh, wow. I, yeah. So for me, listen. I've made the same so far. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I just think that for Minnesota, um, they're getting a new coach here uh, in Sean Mc, Mc, uh, McAuley, McAuley. But the thing yeah. is, is that I think defensively they have some work to do. I love Timo Pukki. That was a great sign for him. Emmanuel Reynoso is just like 
a literal novella every single year. Is he going to play? Is he not? Like, is he going to be here on time? Um, mm-hmm. So with that being said, I, I just think that that's what's going to put Minnesota there at, at, at 13. So Aiden Heath gone f- after being there for a while. Um, and so now they move on to Sean McCauley. But yeah, I just don't see Minnesota having much of a better year here. Okay. Okay. And honestly, I toyed around with the idea of Minnesota. They're, they're probably like right on the outside. Austin is, is my next one. Um, I do feel like for Austin, it's a matter of can they stay healthy? They had a lot of injuries that were an issue last year. Uh, I do think they're going to have a drop off this year, though, and be bottom of the table. They do have players like Jader O'Brien, Diego Rubio, uh, Guillerme, Biro, but I still don't think that Austin, it's it, they're like an injury away from things falling apart, which again, I feel like I could say about some other teams. Yeah. Talk about running it back. That is uh, definitely Austin. And Trav, man, I, I say what the hell because you predicted my, my, my bottom three. I got me a That's coup. hilarious. I got Vancouver at 12, Trav, man. Um, yeah, another team didn't do enough. They're constantly like retooling. I don't even know what the direction is, Vancouver. The thing is, is that like yeah. they can put a solid team together, but then like they're just selling pieces off the following year. So, you know, if mm-hmm. Union fans think you think you have a bad, you could be a Vancouver fan, just put it that way. <laughs> but um, yeah, not enough. Uh, I, I think another fluctuating year so i got them at 12th okay okay well my issues are the same for the east as to why i said it uh why i put these teams at the bottom i should say i'm starting with dc united as the worst team in the east um i see rainy i'll say in new york city uh dc united is in my opinion a team that has a lot going on like that was like my first key thought was there's a lot going on in dc um yes they're they're bringing in you know you've got uh, Troy Les Les is Les is no wow Le- yeah Lesnar yeah yeah from the Red Bull. Uh, you've got Ali McKay. You've got like you've got a new so a new GM and coach in general is, is a lot. Um, but on top of that, they've had over about ten players that have come in and about thirteen players that have gone out. It's almost been like too much change. Now it was needed change. Don't get me wrong, but that change is going to be some time. To, is going to mean they're going to need some time to figure each other out. It's a whole new team, literally. And you need something. I feel like when you have a rebuild, you have to have something that's the same. Like your coaching staff should be the same or a core group of your players. They've got neither. So I think DC United is going to be a team. They might surprise some teams and knock some teams off and, and get some wins that people aren't expecting. But honestly, I think overall, this is a reset, rebuild type of a year for them. And it's it's going to get worse before it gets better. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to agree with you. I got DC here in 15th. Um Ooh. I, I I do kind of like where they are going. I just don't think it, it's going to be, and they're not going to go anywhere this year. But I think putting in McKay, putting in Lester, I think those are two gentlemen who come from good areas. McKay coming from Nashville, who obviously they've they've been a very structured uh, club for the since they came in the league in 2020, and Lester proved himself with his interim turn with the uh, with the Red Bull. So I think they got finally some leadership. They have they have a foundation finally. Like it, it just mm-hmm. they've been taking so many turns the past couple of years. It, it it's it's been dysfunctional. Obviously Wayne Rooney now gone. So yeah. I think they're doing something right, but. I think that this year is going to be some bumps and bruises, and I got them finishing here in 15th. Uh, Trav, man, you didn't predict it, all my picks here, but <laughs> Renee, what do you got here at 14? Yeah, it's funny because I I like the fact that you guys are jumping in the chat with yours because as Raniel and Trav, man, you're sharing yours. I'm like, you know what? We're all on the same page here, which is good. We're consistent um, because my – but my next one I think might catch some people by surprise. It's Toronto. Okay. Um, just, yeah, I think to be honest with Toronto, they've been actively trying to find a a landing spot for Federico and Lorenzo, and they weren't able to do so. Uh, they also did bring in, uh, you know, Tyree Spicer and, and Debbie Flores. Uh, but I just feel like a lot hasn't changed from this team. And also they're just a team that's running it back. And you were at the bottom of the standings last year. You can't afford to run it back. So uh, I'm going with Toronto, and the only reason they get that the heads up on DC United and the spot above them is because they at least have the same pieces coming back. Whereas I feel like DC United, with so much new, is going to be a problem for them. Um, I also have Toronto here. What? Um, Ew, this is weird because we did not. By the way, we did not coordinate any of this. I'm learning this. <laughs> like you're learning this. I don't know JP's picks. I barely know my own picks. I had to find them. I had to find where I wrote them down. Okay. 
you uh, a lot of the reasons you mentioned. I I I do believe in John Herdman. I, I think he's kind of what they do need. Um, come bring it. Obviously, was the manager of of Canada. He obviously Canada had some of its, especially the men's team have had some of their best moments with John Herdman as the coach. So him coming over now to Toronto, bringing bringing just just structure. Uh, it it was extremely dysfunctional last year. It was it was a shit show, lack of better terms. Uh, I don't know how Herman's going to be able to get Lorenzo and Bernadeschi to buy in to the, what's going on. I, I don't know if they will. Um, but I think in this year one, it's important to find that Toronto for so long had an identity. And yeah. they had faces to the team. And that's why they were winning MLS Cups. They got to get back to that. So I think this year it's extremely important. Wins, losses, and draws is not what's important for them. It's about putting that identity back on the pitch there in Toronto. And so uh, it, it, the Lorenzo and Bernadette stuff is going to play out, but they got to figure out their team and what they're going to play like going forward. So I got them sitting here in 14th place this upcoming year. Okay, okay, okay. All right, my team is a team that was mentioned in the chat. I've seen a lot of different teams mentioned in the chat. Montreal, Atlanta, uh, Red Bulls, LAFC. Um, I'm going to actually assume that's a Galaxy because we're doing bottom teams. Um, which, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to assume. So for me, uh, it's actually Chicago. Chicago. And Radio saying Chicago. Yeah, I've got Chicago as – so it's um, – in my opinion, and it could be Charlotte, they were close. They were like honorable mention. They were very close. But I do think that for Chicago, great that they brought in Hugo uh, Kuypers. Awesome. That's a club record deal. Never have pl- paid anybody that much with that $12 million with $2 million in add-ons. Uh, they also added um, some other pieces. Andrew Gutman, Tobias Salquist, uh, Alan Aragoni. But overall, this, the fire needed a lot more. They needed to burn a lot more fire <laughs> into this group. <laughs> and uh, I just, I, you know, Jairo uh, Torres' termination, great, great step, I think, possibly in the right direction. But I don't know. It just, there's a lot of optimism there around Chicago. There's a lot of hopefuls around Chicago. But at the end of the day, I think they're still on the outside looking in. Okay. Um, I It's interesting. I, I, I don't think Chicago will be terrible this year like they've always had, but I don't think they will be good. But I also don't think they'll finish in 13th. Thir- this was tough. The 13th in the East was extremely difficult, and I think it's going to maybe a point, less than a point, will separate 13th, 12th, and 11th. But at 13th, I got Montreal. Oh, another well- them yeah another club i also think is heading in the right direction but this year kind of taking a step back in a way so laurent uh coutois comes over from columbus was the assistant uh with with uh wilford nancy actually comes back to montreal because he was with uh with montreal when wilford nancy was there a lot of good young players we talked about joseph martinez uh signing on there as well which was which was awesome too uh but in general like i i just think that they are maybe a year or two away from competing. I do think that they will get back to where they were last year, where they were second in the East. But for right now, I think they're going to have to go through their bumps and bruises. Laurent is going to have to insert his his tactics and his philosophy onto this young team. So in the future, keep an eye out for Montreal. But for right now, I got him finishing in 13th. Huh. Interesting. Okay, okay. Well, moving to the top teams, this was way more Let's difficult. The yeah. bottom team was tough again because I just felt bad almost like, oh, you're going to have a crappy season. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> but for the top teams, um, this was difficult in a whole different way, especially with the East. So I feel like we should start with the West first. Now, I definitely was considering a team like uh, FC Dallas. It, it was hard for me not to uh, put them in the into the mix. But I, my number three team out of the West is actually St. Louis. While last year was a huge, huge breakout year for St. Louis, I think this is going to be a drop-off, but not a far drop-off for them. Um, You know, in the Western Conference in general, it felt like they took such huge strides last year. Um, I just just feel like overall it's going to be the same team. I think they're going to come with a different level of confidence. Other teams will be more aware. They're not going to, like, sneak up on teams and catch them off guard in the same way. But I do still think that they're going to be a top team just with a slight regression. Um, to be more of that, like number three top team. Okay. Um, so at three, I actually have maybe a little bit of surprise, but I really like what's going on in Dallas. And I, Dallas still sucks, guys. But uh, I, I, I do like that FC Dallas had a good team already. 
And crazy concept, Renee. They splash money on a player. It, it, it's so crazy. But Peter Peter Musa comes over uh, from from Benfica in Portugal. Uh, a twenty five year old Croatian. I think that that is going to surpass. It's going to put Dallas into the top tier of the Western Conference. So I like them here at, at three. Already strong team. Yeah. You add another score in there with Jesus Ferreira. Well, and also we'll keep an eye on Jesus Ferreira. Obviously, we all know the story. He was supposed to go to Russia. The, the league vetoed it. So I'm curious to see if yeah. he actually gets sold in the, in the summer to a team. Um, but for now, it, it, it's still a lot of attack here. Mm-hmm. I know in the chat, Dan and Travman, uh, you're, you're co-signing on Colorado as a top three team. Um, but you're saying LAFC, Seattle, Colorado for Travman. Listen, the West was tough because I felt like a lot of these teams would be middle of the pack for the East. <laughs> and it was hard for me to pick, like, who do I feel like is truly going to be a top team? But another team that spent money, RSL. I think Real Salt Lake is going to be the number two team. They invested a lot into this team. Um, they broke their club record incoming transfer amount twice last season. They've been really spending a lot of money. Bring in Andres Gomez, um, you know, Pablo Ruiz, who's going to be back from injury, Diego Luna. You know, this yeah. is a team that's got a lot of talent. And if they can stay healthy in these pieces, even like a Fidel Barajas, um, who came from the USL and Charles Charleston, uh, Matt Crooks, they've got a lot of talent that they've added. They've been spending. They've been making some major moves. Um, this 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 could be huge. This could be a big season for them, a breakout year for for RSL to take that next step. That's funny. I, I had them. Um, I, I had them at three, but I, I, I just like what Dallas is doing more now. Listen, if they do get James Rodriguez, things change here for ours. So, all right, things do change a little bit there. Very true. Um, I have here at number two. I have Houston. Oh, oh huge, them. huge year last year. Took huge strides. Still really young. Ben Olsen again back there. Um, I really like Houston to take another big step here and finish second in the West. We'll see how far they can go. But Ben Olsen's doing something right down there. And I know DC fans hate to see that, but I like Houston in year two of Ben Olsen. Okay. Well, I feel like we have the same number one. And I think if anybody has somebody different at number one out of the West or doesn't have this <laughs> team in their top three, you're doing something very wrong. Uh, LAFC for sure at number one out of the West. Listen, LAFC really did a lot this offseason, too. Um, my guy, John McCarthy, now with LA, LA Galaxy. Uh, Max May Crepo gone as well. Bringing in Hugo Loris as their new goalkeeper. Um, you've got uh, Dennis Buanga. You've got Eduardo Atuesta. You know, the talent that they have mixed in with the talent that they've added, um, it's, it's going to be a really good team still. Uh, I don't think they're going to be a team that's going to – run through it won't be easy to even win the west or be a top team in the west but i do think lafc is still the top dog sitting on on the you know holding that number one spot out of the west still yeah i got the la galaxy finishing i'm, I'm totally kidding guys <laughs> <LAFC's gonna finish laughs> uh, <first. laughs> lafc i think they're gonna finish first i uh, it's 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 crazy this team like they don't they don't weaken they just get stronger and again, I, they, they just got so much stronger. And like, there's even question marks about Danny Boong. You know what's crazy, Renee? Like, if they lose him, I, I'm a, I wouldn't even be worried if I'm an LAFC fan because no. I'll probably just bring like Anton Griezmann, and that'll replace the Danny Boong. And it's going to be this constant cycle here. Travman thinks that um, um, Hugo Lloris is going to bring the Spurs curse over to LAFC. I, I don't know. Well, Oof. LAFC's got some luck. Yeah, it is. It is definitely possible. Um, I, I see a lot of love with Colorado. I just don't know if they're ready just yet. Like, just think about like they had Robin Frazier, who's probably the best manager in their club's history. And they fired and they sacked him because the team around them was dysfunctional and someone had to get scapegoated. Now, mm-hmm. really like what they did in this offseason. They didn't bring in just big players. I think they brought in players that fit a culture that they, you can build upon. I don't know if Colorado is just there yet, but it is interesting. Um, Renee. East. I'm not ready for this. I'm not ready for this. Okay. Um, (laughs) this was really difficult. And I made the mistake of doing this group first. I should have did them last. I I'm not gonna lie, guys. I don't think we should have done just the top three for the east. I know we're over time, so I'm gonna try to go through this quickly. But holy crap, this the east is really difficult. So I unfortunately don't even have Columbus in my top three. Okay. I don't have the reigning champs in my top three for the East this year. And that scares me and terrifies me. 
easily I could have I felt like I could have put them in that spot. But I also feel like as we were talking about before, it is tough to you know back to back. It's tough to stay on that top spot. And with the talent of the Eastern Conference gauntlet that that there is, there's enough teams that can knock them off that spot. So as much as I wanted to put them in number in the top three, my number three team is actually Inter Miami. Now, okay. many people might be feeling like with Messi alone, this team should be number one and number two. And then, of course, you have around him Sergio Busquets, Jordi Alba, Luis Suarez. Um, but I feel like when what we've seen so far, even in their preseason tour, granted, I know it's just preseason, they still have a lot of question marks of how this team's going to come together and defensively. You know, uh, Julian Gressel's a, a big piece. Nicholas Fr- uh, Fryer is a big piece. But overall, their defense has shown – that that's an area of weakness. And if you're going to make every game a shootout, you've got your your top four, your big four, are also on the older side as well. You know, let's be honest. This is not them in their prime. And so it's a long season. It's a lot of games. They have to stay healthy. And their defense has to be able to keep up with the talent of their offense. And there's just a lot of pressure. And I don't fully believe that just signing the biggest names is going to automatically make you a top team. Everyone's going to play Inter Miami with their best game. Every game against them is like the MLS Cup. So you're not ever going to go into a game and just slide past someone and sneak in and and steal three points. So I actually feel like they will still be a top team. I think they're going to be the number three team. But when we get to our playoff predictions um, come Thursday, I think you might be surprised by where I think they're going to finish come postseason. Okay. Um, At three, I actually do have the reigning champs, Columbus. Um, I think that it's only going to get better because Will Fernandes in year number two with a group that's already comfortable with him. I think Kucho Hernandez is going to have another big season here, and they got some depth. I think that's the important part here, especially when you're talking about the the, the schedule, um, the amount of matches a lot of these teams are going to have to play, especially when you're the reigning champs in the Columbus crew. So I, I like the crew here at number three. We got here too. Okay, I just want to say I can see the crew being like a number four team, but then come playoff time making a deep run because they're they're always going to bring that fire. They have the talent. They have that chip on their shoulder. And that's why my number two team, Cincinnati, is oh, sitting at number two okay. because I feel like they definitely, as winning the Supporter Shield last year, another team that's done a lot, and they are a complete team. This is a really good group. Uh, Aaron Bupenza, excuse me, Five Gordon goals hated in, in Philly. <laughs> yes, five goals in three preseason matches. He's been finding the back of the night. He's been playing very well. This team overall just has so much talent. They lost a lot, but they brought in a lot. You know, Miles Robinson, Pavel Bucha. Uh, they're, they've really had a lot of changes, but it makes them scary because they're bringing in pieces that are going to be 90-minute players for them and starters that are ready now. That there's, there will not be a major learning curve. They're young. They're in their prime. And I just see them being tough to even have a scouting report on that because they're so new and so different. But also just having, you know, that extra itch for wanting to go further. You know, being that you win the Supporter Shield and then you fall short overall, not enough for them. They're going to be hungry and they're talented and they're new. I'm nervous, but I, SC Cincinnati is definitely my number two team. I, I so for me with Cincinnati, I think they're going to be good again this year. They're not going to be supporter shield good. Um, but like replacing Brandon Vasquez is going to be interesting. Alvaro Barreal still here. Um, uh, but he was like heavily rumored to Europe. Didn't happen this this uh, period. Wonder if it'll happen in the summer where it's easier to get sold to Europe. Uh so just like a lot of moving parts, and I'm just wondering how that'll affect the scene, but they'll still be in, in the playoff picture for sure. Uh Noonan's doing a really good job here. So two, I, I do have Inter Miami here. Um, I agree with uh with Dan here. I, I think age, schedule, congestion may be effective here for Miami, but let's remember like that August, that leagues cup month like you kind of saw the full potential of what miami could be i don't think they're going to run away with this i don't think they're going undefeated here like a lot of people yeah. do th- may think they they will do they will have their bumps and bruises but overall i think renee they're going to have like their spurts well they'll, they'll go on like some winning streaks and they'll gain mm-hmm. a lot of points in that but then they'll get back come back down to earth they might have a little bit of a losing streak but i think there'll be a lot of fluctuations in their season and i think miami at the end of the day will have enough points to finish in second it this roster in general, it is really good. Like not not just for MLS, but for just soccer in general, it is really good. So I do see them finishing here in second. 
So that leaves us here with number one in the East. Okay. So for me, I'm going with Orlando sitting at number one. Uh, Duncan McGuire, guys. Uh, that's all I got to say is McGuire is back. And having such a breakout year, um, you know, being able to score goals, but also now with this offseason hiccup of is he going to be back from the MLS? Is he moving on? Uh, I think we're going to really see him be more confident, a little more, again, that intensity. When you have something to prove, it makes you a very scary team. Um, Orlando, I feel like, also made a, a number of other key additions, though, that they added in. They just added in, um, you know, whether it was changes to their front office or changes to their back line. They've been very, very busy. And so I can't help but think that this team – It's going to take some major strides. The way they lost in the playoffs last year to me was kind of like, we got a red card. We're out. They they felt they were playing down, playing catch up the entire time. And that leaves a bad taste in your mouth. And to add a defender like David Bercalo, to have McGuire back, um, to have Robin um, Jansen, you know, there's so many pieces here. This is, this is another team that I think is going to be scary to watch. So uh, I'm going with Orlando at number one, actually, coming out of the East. It is really hard to (laughs) argue with Orlando finishing first in the Eastern Conference. And I'm curious how they're going to be handling this because Orlando City in their history have never been in this situation. So it's really going to be interesting to see how they do handle it. But you just mentioned it. They've they've had probably the best offseason. That's why we are predicting them to finish number one. This is a team that's already strong as it was. I think they would finish like fourth or fifth in the in the uh, East last year. Yeah. Um. So you you add that with a MLS Cup winning coach and Oscar Pareja, mm-hmm. I, the the recipe is there for oh and bringing in Luis Muriel who has Champions League experience, uh, international mm-hmm. competition experience, and match that with Duncan McGuire who you want to talk about motivated and there's no mean there's going to be no one more pissed off than Dun- Duncan McGuire this com- I mean coming out of MLS season after what happened with with Blackburn but this is a stack roster it is well managed it, it, it's going to be a tough task going down to explore it especially like in the summer where it's it's the, the heat down there is no fun even at night you still feel that humidity so I, it's it's tough to say, but Orlando might be yeah. a fun team to watch. And it's funny because like that, I remember like the beginning parts of Atlanta being in the league. Atlanta was always making fun of Orlando. Well, Orlando may be having some laughs, not only against Atlanta, but a lot of other teams here in the MLS. <laughs> and you know what? I think to me what, what it came down to was what offseason moves did you make? What's the youth of your team? A team like Inter Miami, who on paper is extremely exciting. They're going to sell a lot of tickets, a lot of jersey sales. But at the end of the day, they are aging. It's a very long season. It's survival of the fittest. So you need to have depth, youth, talent. You also need to have some level of like intensity and this hunger. And that's why I think teams like Orlando, SC Cincinnati, you're out to prove something on top of the talent. It makes every game, you're thinking playoffs. You're thinking, you know, totally different in terms of your mindset. So yeah, this is a difficult list and honestly for, most difficult for the East because there are about five or six teams that Literally. easily can be in the top three. And so uh, I'm excited. It's got me excited for it. Yeah, guys. So uh, obviously, Trav Man's been putting his bottom three, top threes. If you guys want to put them in the comment section, you guys can tweet us as well. Uh, we would love to see what you guys are predicting here in the Eastern and Western Conference. It should be a lot of fun. Um, as we're dwindling down to the end of the show, uh, Thursday should be a lot of fun, Renee. Um, I'm yeah. sure a lot of people, including ourselves, are going to want to talk about a brand new kit that the you should be dropping tomorrow. Uh, I'm excited to see it. Um, I'm not allowed to talk about the the the, the kit, but um, <laughs> yeah, so it should be a, a lot of fun there. Um, real quick before we sign off, I just want to talk real quick about the the attackers here. Uh, the attackers that we have here on the team, and we'll we'll talk about all all the the news and the kits on Thursday there. Uh, but let's look real quick here, uh, Renee, with the the attacking unit here for the Philadelphia Union. Um, and when you're looking at the attack, obviously you got to talk midfielders, you got to talk uh, forwards here for the Union. Uh, so let's look at the options here that the Union have as far as attack goes. Uh, so obviously um, you have yourself uh, Daniel Gazak is back here again. For another season, Michael Ua as one of the forwards, Julian Carranza as another forward. So typically those are your big three. And then behind those guys, you obviously have 
uh, uh, Joaquin Torres, Jeremy Raffaniello. We'll see what Jim decides to run as those positions. Obviously, those guys are pretty flexible, but those guys would be expected to be some depth as attacking midfielders. Uh, we also do have our uh, Chris Donovan coming back for another season. Uh, we've heard Quinn Sullivan in a potential what could be his role here. Obviously, we've heard a lot of him playing at that right midfielder in a diamond, but we all know he could play as a winger or as a forward. Interest, interest to see how he develops again this year, what kind of role we do stick with. We talked a lot about Marcus Anderson. He is the new, one of the new signings here. Ty Barribo was one of the signings last year. Um, so a lot of good options here in the attack, a lot of youth as well as of course, oh, Nick Periano, let me not forget Nick Periano as well. So a lot of youth here in, in, uh, with this unit here, Renee, but again, uh, uh, this attack took a little bit of a dip in, in the stats wise, as far as goals and, and goals expected uh, from 22 to 23. And this year there's gonna be a lot of expectations, not especially for the, the main three Gaza, Karanza, and Uwa to perform and, and, and get more goals because obviously we did last year but the depth there was a lot of question marks what's behind Caranza and, and Uwa what's behind Daniel Gazek and to me that's the bigger question mark Renee yeah and honestly this is why when we were coming up with our standings uh the one thing I'll say on this really quickly is when we were coming up with our standings and I was looking at the additions and the attack of other teams specifically around the east compared to the union uh, I do feel like there, there is a difference and not a great difference in favor of the unions. Uh, you know, the big three of Carranza, Gazag, and Ua, uh, compared to some others, ah, makes me a little nervous. But I will say, I think this year, to be honest, and I'm not saying this is like a hot take, I genuinely do believe in 2024, we're going to see Quinn Sullivan rise to be one of the best attackers. Whether he's, right. his role is as, as a midfielder or as a forward, I think his aggression, his eagerness, his intensity his pace his ability to just make runs and creativity if he gets those options to start and opportunities i should say to get meaningful minutes early on i think quinn sullivan's confidence alone is going to help him i don't know which of the big three in terms of Carranza, gazag and ua he'll be performing better than but i wouldn't be Ooh. surprised if by the end of the season we're having a different conversation about quinn sullivan in that mix but marcus anderson chris donovan ty Baribo, um, Joaquin Torres, if he does stay or whatever happens with him in the future, they are that next tier. And hopefully one of them can rise up to fully be that complimentary piece outside of the big three and Quinn. <laughs> I like that. No, I really do. And you know, what, Renee, like this, this whole unit, like there's a lot of question marks. Uh, it's funny because going into last year, you know, you were high off Gazdag, you were high off Caranza, even Ua. Like, you, you know, you knew like there was more from Ua. And this year, the feeling is a little bit different. You know, there's 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 some skepticism over Gazdag. You know, we don't know the future of Caranza. Is he going to get sold off in the summer? Ua, I mean, there's people who want the one replacement for Ua as well. And then we just talked mm -hmm. about the depth. We don't really know exactly what the depth is going to look like behind those players. So a lot of chips on the, on their shoulders for some of these guys here in the attack. And honestly, like we know what the potential is. We've seen these guys score six or seven goals in the game. And I don't think that's going to be the expectations here, but um, we, we it's, it's fair to expect more uh, from the attack here, especially more goals. We, we know it can happen. It definitely can happen, and hopefully, yes, Travman at some point, <laughs> Kevin Sullivan, the GOAT, Captain Merrick, whatever you want to call him, um, is going to help um, win some titles, some hardware, starting with maybe an MLS Next Pro Cup. And then we'll but go to is, Europe. First the Union, then Europe. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. But it is very exciting um, because there's potential there. I know we start off the show very optimistic about the Union, but the reality of it is the East is a gauntlet, and running it back makes me nervous. But if you can run it back and make some major changes like Quinn Sullivan's role being more established and early on um, getting the attack going on early on, you know, those are the types of things that can definitely help this team be able to be right in the mix at that top of the group. But we'll see. I know we've got more to, to talk about Thursday, JP, as we continue our predictions ahead of the yeah. start of the season. I'm so ex I'm so excited. We're, we're going to talk some kits. We're going to talk. So hopefully maybe we'll have some more breaking news. We'll talk about a stream, not even just scrolling like yeah. I get to watch it. It should be a lot of fun. Right. Too. Wednesday's game, tomorrow's game, I should say, is streamed. The Philadelphia Union already tweeted out the link in advance. Wow. So you can go check that out. And then Thursday, we'll, of course, break down the the pre the final preseason matchup against the Revs, as well as give our predictions on the playoffs. Because why not? I mean, it's never too early. We're gonna we're gonna give our early predictions like a time capsule. We'll give them now. We'll see how they age of what we think 
you know, the playoff picture is going to look like and things such as coach of the year and player of the year. So it's It's time. A lot lot of fun, of course, as well. Tomorrow is Valentine's Day. Alejandro Bedoya, will you be our Valentine? I'm obviously kidding. But uh, guys, enjoy your Valentine's Day, whoever you're spending it with. Have a lot of fun. Be safe out there. I hate that it's on a a Wednesday, but I'll I'll be, you know me, Renee, I'll I'll be whipping in the kitchen here tomorrow. So. (laughs) I'm 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 excited. I'm excited. Hopefully you guys have a great Valentine's Day as well. I can't wait to talk yes. to them on Thursday. Yes. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. And we'll see you guys more on Thursday for more. Absolutely. For Renee Washington, of course, I'm JP Sapata. Make sure you guys hit that like button and subscribe. We will see you guys here on Thursday, same time, same place. Union fans, we love you. We'll talk to you soon. Dude.